On today's Prophecy in the News, we're going to talk about a book that I found some months ago in a little bookstore in Virginia. It's entitled Light on Prophecy. And for the past several months, we have been taking sermons out of this prophecy conference that was held in Philadelphia back in 1918 and putting them in our magazine. And by the way, our magazine, the November edition of Prophecy in the News, has the, uh, the sermon that I would like to discuss today. And Gary Stearman is here to discuss with me this, what is to become of the church? Mm. The Reverend Harris H. Gregg gave a talk on uh, Memorial Day, May 30th, 1918. And J.R., it was the first Memorial Day, uh, a proclamation signed uh, into effect by President Woodrow Wilson. And on the occasion of the memorial of thousands and thousands of cruel deaths in World War I, this day was set aside. And he asks the question, what is to become of the church? And I can't help thinking about the, uh, the swirl of social events in his day and the, w the war just having uh, come to a close. A lot of people said this is the war to end all wars and Jesus is coming right now, you know, and uh, mm -hmm. he'll be among us soon. There was that kind of talk in the air. So on this Memorial Day, with all of the crosses out there across the graveyards, yeah. with all of the open graves, people following caskets out to the gravesite, uh, for the past several years, um, the the qu great question on the minds of people was the resurrection. The resurrection. And so basically when he says, what is to become of the church? He says, we shall rise again. That's basically his theme. And Gary, uh, Dr. Gregg here, and by the way, it's, it's, um, it, it's in this magnificent book that we have here. Um, but when he begins, he takes two uh, texts, two scripture passages, and one is in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the other is in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And of course, he begins by saying, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. What a fitting sermon for mm. this first Memorial Day. Indeed. And he's talking here about the resurrection. The, the next verse says, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, the dead uh, shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Talking about the resurrection. And he devotes this entire speech to a, a discussion of the mystery of the resurrection. And, and J.R., we're both amazed as we studied this at... Uh, at the level of his understanding of prophetic things. He, he believed in a coming millennium, that we were living in a time before that millennium. He believed in a rapture of the church mm -hmm. prior to a time of judgment. So he really had the belief system, the eschatology uh, that we, we hold here at Prophecy in the News. Yes, and he was a pastor of a church up in Winnipeg. And get the scene here, if you will, please. It's 1918, May 30th. And uh, it's, it's in the morning. The congregation of over 3,000 people are there ready to hear the Word of God. And uh, the city of Jerusalem had been liberated just six months before. And the world was, was winding down World War I. Of course, they didn't know it was number one. Mm. They didn't know a number two was coming along, so yeah. they called it the Great War or the World War. And so he begins by saying, the Word of God is the only thing standing today. It alone abides when sin has brought in death. He says, in righteousness it curses the unbelief of Cain, and in grace blesses the faith of Abel. It buried Babylon and will yet build Jerusalem again. So this whole mm -hmm. idea of the return of the Jews to their homeland mm -hmm. is centered around two things, the mystery of godliness mm -hmm. and the mystery of iniquity. And he says the mystery of godliness will be done when the rapture takes place and the saints are taken home. This was God's purpose. And he said it all began at Pentecost and he implied that it would end at Pentecost too, didn't he? <laughs> oh yes, he did. In fact, uh, we have done studies on that and we, we have done some, I think, groundbreaking studies on Pentecost as a type of the rapture. But here is Dr. Gregg, all the way back in 1918. He understands the Feast of Israel. And as we get into uh, more 
uh, detail as we go through his, his discussion, you'll see how amazingly uh, informed these men were all the way back in this, this period. Mm -hmm. And after the world going to war, he says, the world today is impaled upon its rejection and crucifixion of God's word. And therefore, like Israel, hangs bleeding and helpless on the cross. He says, the word of God alone will come to their help who cannot save themselves. He said, Pilate ordered Christ's legs to be broken. But the word of God said, not a bone of him should be broken. Mm. So when the Roman soldier came to break his legs, he determined that he was already dead, was not necessary. Therefore, he pierced his side. But the word of God says in Zechariah 12, they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. So when God says something, when the word of God says something, it's going to come about just as he said it. Hmm. He said that he, w he would not have any broken bones, but Pilate, <laughs> who represented the Roman Empire, said, break his bones. No matter what man says or government says, God's word mm -hmm. is going to be fulfilled precisely. And J.R., he uses that thought as a jumping off place to to talk about the, the types and symbols beginning with the creation of the Lord, the seven days of creation, which mm -hmm. he uh, summarizes and likens to a prophetic plan or program. And I think yeah. he's got some very interesting ideas here. He really does. And he says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. <laughs> he says, neither are your ways my ways. For as high as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. So when... When man says, break his legs, God says, no. That's it. They're not. And when God says he's going to be pierced, but uh, government says, we don't know anything about that, he still gets pierced. Because God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts. So we go to these seven days of creation, Gary, and we notice that the Spirit of God brings in light on the first day, but then the light fades. Night comes. The mm -hmm. sun is down behind the horizon. Mm -hmm. And it looks like God has failed. Ah, uh, but a few hours later, that second day comes along, mm -hmm. and it's bright again. But alas, at the end of that second day, it turns dark again. So... What we're looking at here is chaos. You remember Adam uh, was perfect, mm -hmm. but he sinned and brought mankind down to chaos. So we have the mystery of godliness and the mystery of iniquity with the sunrise and the sunset. And basically, I think, Gary, that's, that's what he has in mind here as he proceeds with this methodical lecture on the Word of God about What's going to become of the church? Uh, J.R., I like what he did with the seventh day because he likened the seventh day of creation, uh, which we know as a day of rest, to a, a model, if you will, mm -hmm. of, of mankind. He says, but man's day too ends in darkness and then comes the seventh day with no mention of succeeding night for it is rest and day and day of God. It was toward this nightless day that God had been working from the first. Mm -hmm. That's a great thought. Yes, the day that doesn't have a night, looking out into the future. Yeah. So for six days, night follows day. Chaos follows right. godliness. Iniquity follows godliness. But on the seventh day, there is no night. And so God has a nightless day somewhere in the future for us. And basically, that's when it's all wrapped up. And so uh, he takes these seven days and he likens them unto the history of man and the earth in chaos and man and mankind in chaos. But then he takes this brief summary, he says, of the Bible, the proper setting of our subject. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the last thing he created was man. He made him a trinity, said, let us, not let me, let us make man in our image, not my image, but our image. And so uh, God has given his crowning creation here in the work of creating man. And then Adam, of course, became through sin what the earth had once become a chaos covered with darkness. Well, J.R., to me, the real uh, edifying feature of, of, this, uh, of this article, uh, which, by the way, is just a transcription 
uh, of Dr. Gregg's speech, and it's beautifully written, but, but the edifying effect of it is to, to give you a, an overview of God's prophetic program. And it's very optimistic. That is to say, if you're down in the dumps, you need to read this because yeah. it'll lift you right up. And you can read the whole thing in the November Prophecy in the News magazine. You know, all the way back in 1918, Dr. Gregg uh, made this statement, which I find eerily uh, familiar. Uh, he said, because of man's sin, nature is as much out of gear as man. Man cannot throw light upon himself any more than he can upon nature. All light comes from the heavens. Man can no more straighten out himself than he can straighten out nature. He can no more stop wars and rumors of wars than he can stop pestilence. And you know, J.R., uh, we talk about the we talk about uh, the green peace, and we talk about the greening of the world, mm -hmm. and we try we, we we're talking about trying to uh, change uh, man's behavior so as to improve nature. And Dr. Gregg was right then. If he were still alive today, he'd still be right. Man cannot improve himself. Yes. He cannot improve nature. The whole the whole situation is thrown out of gear because. Uh, the creation is awaiting the Messiah. And he builds toward this in a, in a very remarkable way, prophetically. He does, and this is what he writes. When man became chaos and turned the earth into chaos, God's plan did not have to be changed. <laughs> so God knew what he was doing. That's right. Because you see, with the coming of Jesus Christ, um, the pattern of every redeemed uh, is given. And we, one day we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And in Philippians, he refers to this, by the way, in Philippians, we're told that Jesus Christ, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon himself the form of a servant, made like unto the image of men, and to the likeness of men, being found in fashion of a man, he humbled himself, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And what he's saying is here, Jesus was not aspiring to the prize of being like God. He was God. What he was aspiring to, the prize he wanted was man. So he came from heaven's glory and became a man, went all the way down below the, uh, the level of the angels, below the level of man, below the level of Satan. He went to hell, Gary, and he conquered all of that, and he rose again to bring us with him that one day we shall be like him. And so the question that he has here at the outset of his message, what is to become of the church? That's what is to become of the church. Mm -hmm. We shall be like Jesus. Absolutely. And, and he uses these beautiful figures to describe this. And he talks about the new creation. And he says the risen Christ is the beginning of the new creation. It was risen from the dead. Christ is not only the last man. He's the first begotten from the dead. The beginning of the new creation. That's the creation that he's talking about, the, the, uh, the day in, in which there is no night, the new creation. Yes. Uh, we're all waiting for that. We're waiting for his coming. And we know, as he knew, that certain darkness has to fall in this last mm -hmm. day. And uh, he was watching for that, and so should we. Yeah. And so he says here, when he has completed his church, and completed its salvation by resurrection, and translated it to heaven, then he must needs return to bind Satan and cast him into the pit, to redeem and restore Israel to himself in their land, to establish God's throne in the house of his father David, in righteousness and peace in the earth, to redeem nature from its curse and groanings in this generation, and to fill the earth with his glory that once filled the most holy place of the tabernacle and the holy of holies of the temple. He said, his kingdom over the earth will, be sh will share in the glory of his new creation. But even this is not final. For after it, he creates a new heaven and the new earth and returns the kingdom to his father that God then and there may be all in all. So what he's basically saying here, Gary, is that the church is going to be gone before the tribulation hmm. period. Now he's holding a view when he says that, uh, that is contrary to the majority of the organized church of his day. 
Uh, there was a very strong post-millennial uh, movement a at that time. And after World War I, J.R., there was a contest sort of between post-millennialism and pre-millennialism, mm -hmm. basically competing views of, of eschatology. Still goes on to this day to some degree, but he presents an excellent case likening the seven days of creation, uh, the last day being a day with no night, to God's plan. Mm -hmm. there, there's of necessity going to be another period of darkness before that light comes. And therein lies the discussion. Yes. Is there going to be a period of darkness ahead or will, it, will we all just proceed toward the light and eventually welcome the Lord into the kingdom? Well, mm -hmm. we take the view that there's a dark period ahead, a period of judgment. And so did yeah. Dr. Gregg. By the way, J.R., he then he goes from the seven days of creation to the seven feasts of Israel, and yes. he continues uh, this parallel. I, I love what he does with that. Four in the spring, three in the fall. He talks mm -hmm. about the seven feasts of Israel. As God had in seven days in connection with his creation, so the feasts of the Lord we have the relationship or rela revealed to us the seven days of his new creation. <laughs> mm. So we have seven feasts in seven months and they represent basically the same thing as the first seven days, the days of creation. Namely, that this world is going to be here for 6,000 years and then the Lord will come and establish the millennial kingdom. And before that millennial kingdom comes, the resurrection will occur. Now, Gary theology, Christian theology, especially coming out of Germany. And you know, these guys really trounced on German theology yes, in this did. prophecy conference. Um, basically, that says uh, we're going to bring in the kingdom for a thousand years, and then the Lord will come and say, well done, fellas. That's correct. Then there were some who said, no millennium at all. Mm -hmm. uh, there's not going to be a millennium. That Jesus is not going to come back, or that he will just come back. There'll be a general resurrection and the sheep and the goats, and it'll all be over. That's right. Um, but the Jewish rabbis all wrote that the Messiah would come and establish the Messianic kingdom. And this is just simply uh, premillennial theology uh, from the Jews themselves. Well, and so in, in, a, in accepting and adopting premillennial theology, you know, we're just keeping up with what the Jews have said down through the centuries. And it makes perfect sense because uh, uh, for a Jew, premillennialism is the natural state of things. In other words, mm -hmm. they're looking forward to that. Well, the church, uh, starting the days of John Nelson Darby and then C.I. Schofield and others, uh, began to be aware of the fact that Israel was coming back to the land. And uh, they were starting to make rather bold statements uh, uh, compared with what was being said in their day. Very bold statements. Israel's coming back. It won't be very long before Israel's a nation. And guess what? It took about 50 years after that. Israel yeah. did become a nation. That's right. And so in a, in a strange sense, Christian believers and Jewish believers are both premillennialists. That is correct. Now, about these holy days, he goes through Passover, Feast of Unleavened Bread, Feast of First Fruits, and likens that to the first advent of Christ. And then he says, and, and by the way, it's true, the Lamb of God was crucified on Passover. He was buried uh, according to the Unleavened Bread uh, uh, Festival, and he rose again on the Feast of First Fruits. And he's the first fruits of the resurrection. Mm -hmm. Now he says, 50 days after the Feast of First Fruits came Pentecost, another Feast of First Fruits, and the fourth and the last of the spring feasts. On the day of Pentecost, the Lord Jesus in heaven baptized his apostles and disciples in Jerusalem with the Holy Spirit. And uh, so he likens that to the launching of this mystery of godliness. In fact, he says all the mysteries in the Bible are actually Pentecostal mysteries. Yes. They all, just put them all with Pentecost, he says. There's no sense in going through all the mysteries. Just lump them all together with Pentecost. In other words, Pentecost is the beginning and the ending of it. <laughs> he yeah. says, he says, then summer followed Pentecost. The rain ceased. The streams went dry. The fields were parched. The shepherds hunted pasture. The wolves fed. <laughs> 
And then at last, he says, in September, late in September, the Feast of Trumpets, the first of the autumn feast, broke the silence. It is the seventh month, the time for God to complete what He has begun. So at the beginning mm -hmm. of the seventh millennium, he's basically saying here, God's going to begin to wrap everything up. Yeah, it's amazing. He takes a very simple observation. The four spring feasts uh, are what he refers to as the beginning. The three fall feasts, which would be trumpets, Day of Atonement, Sukkot, or uh, tabernacles, those three fall feasts are the summing up. It's time for God to complete what he has begun. And it's a very simple statement, but very profound, too. Mm -hmm. And so he says, then followed the Feast of the Day of Atonement, following trumpets. And by the way, trumpets, uh, he says, is a memorial of the blowing of the trumpets around Jericho. In other words, mm. it, it says war. It says tribulation. He says yes. Jacob's trouble. And bringing in the kingdom, by the way, as well, because that's when Israel crossed over the Jordan, came into the land. Yes. And so then comes the Feast of Atonement. And he talks about this door of salvation. I like that. We talked about yes, that we uh, did. last week. And uh, God's appointment with the high priest entering the Holy of Holies on behalf of Israel. Coming out again meant God's acceptance of the atonement. His acknowledgement of Israel as His redeemed people. He says, when He has His feast of the Day of Atonement, the Jews will be in their day of Jacob's trouble. And Christ shall come out of His heavenly sanctuary like the high priest out of the Holy of Holies. Mm -hmm. And he says, he'll come to earth for Israel's salvation. So the Day of Atonement represents the second coming of Christ in power and great glory, Revelation chapter 19. J.R., he had another idea that's interesting too, and by the way, you, we can't report on this in detail. You'll have to read it for yourself, but he talks about the mysteries. Uh, such as the mystery of the kingdom of heaven, the mystery of Christ in the church, the mystery of godliness, and so forth. And he says, those mysteries belong to the Pentecostal age. That is, that they, they are lumped into that first grouping of four festivals. Mm -hmm. uh, but the uh, trumpets and beyond are the wrapping up of those mysteries, the, if you will, the, the reconciling of the mysteries. Now, that's a to me, is a, a kind of an interesting idea to work with. Yeah. And he, he was a great orator, wasn't he? Oh, yeah. Listen, listen to what he said. He's winding up his sermon now. He says, the mystery of godliness includes both Christ and his church received up into glory. Refers to the destiny of the church. It's conditionless and timeless. After the mystery of godliness is completed by the church being caught up into heaven, then the mystery of iniquity will rapidly develop and head up in Satan's Antichrist, the man who will claim to be God. He believed in a pre-tribulation rapture. Absolutely. It was 1918. <laughs> <laughs> and may the Lord cause his tribe to increase, because we believe that very same thing. Absolutely. So, if you're worried about pre-trib uh, rapture, or pre-wrath rapture, or mid-trib rapture, or post-tribulation rapture, just understand that uh, the mystery of iniquity will commence when the mystery of godliness is caught up into glory. Jesus is our resurrection. And because he rose again, we shall too. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. The dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So the question is, what about your soul? Where are you today? Trust in Jesus Christ. Ask Him to forgive you and save you. He will, you know. He loves you. This is J.R. Church and Gary Stearman. Until next time, keep looking up.